disclaimers. All right, my disclaimers that I'm required to put in. All right, so we're really all here because of, uh, as you know, there's been a huge uh, increase in technology and sequencing. So over a course of about 20 years, it went from a very manual process where you poured the gels, loaded the gels, and actually scored them by hand. There were some little devices made to help you do that, which never worked. Uh, so you just sat down with a, uh, you know, that's why I can't type today because I spent one hand doing ACGT, ACGT, and that's about all I can do on the keyboard. Mm -hmm. um, then they went through a, a series where it became a little more automated, so the data collection became more automated. You still had to do a lot, interact with the screen a lot here and align those lanes, but the actual base calling became automatic with fluorescent markers, this is radioactive. And then it became pretty much a, a fully automated system with the introduction of the capillaries. And the capillaries then were, it would pump the gel in, so it's like pouring the gel, it would uh, run the sample for you, it would call the bases. Uh, and for the Human Genome Project, we were able to fill rooms full of that, those in sort of a, a linear, linearly scalable process. And over a, a short 10-year uh, period, there were a number of uh, genome sequences. A lot of the technology for the sequencing was driven by a lot of this uh, to sequence things like C. elegans got sequenced first, uh, then there was uh, E. coli, human, mouse, all these things, but those, the technology was uh, driven through that yeast. Yes. E. coli actually took a long time. We'll get into that. But there was a real revolution around 2005. It sort of started a little bit earlier, but the first commercial platforms came out, and that's what we'll talk about. In, uh, that was, uh, that's not that long ago, really, right? I mean, that's, that's only eight years ago, and that's the, um, the really the, the what, why you're here today is because the, the data that we generated through here was manageable, and now the data here is, as you'll see, is not very manageable. Just an example of about eight years of technology is more like 10. This thumb drive is 64 megs. This thumb drive is half a terabyte, right? So those are about 10 years apart. I got this one when I got my first cluster. They gave me a thumb drive, 64 megs. <laughs> But at that time, that was huge. And you, what you say, your first terabyte hard drive was a million dollars? Quarter. Quarter million dollars. And now, now they're, you know, I don't know, 200, 200 bucks. Yeah. <laughs> so technology is driven forward, but it's creating all sorts of problems. So one of the advantages of NextGen, though, as I said, is that uh, there's no subcloning. So when we did the human genome, every template that we sequenced, we had to clone it and we had to uh, grow it in a bacterium and we had to purify it. And so you can imagine there was, that was a lot of work. So we had lots of robots to do that. And now a lot of that's done for you. Um, the data, of course, uh, we'll get into data, but the real thing is now you're just getting huge amounts of data per run, as you'll see. And so you have to have the tools to use it. I'm going to talk a little bit historically, just to bring, make sure everyone's on the same page about technologies and that sort of thing and what the data look like. Uh, this was the first one that came out. This is the 454. Uh, instrument that came out. Uh, it was bought subsequently to Roche. That's the paper. And it were, I'll go, just quickly go through the process of how, how it works because it's very similar. There's subtle differences in the instruments I'll point out, but usually if you're doing, we'll just talk about whole genome sequencing for now. If you're going to sequence a genome, the first thing you have to do is break it up into pieces. And that's not any different than what we did with the human genome. We broke that up into, into clones. Uh, then you make a, a library. The, the trick here was they couldn't detect single molecules or not enough signals, so they did what's called an emulsion PCR. So you have a bead, in the, this is a, inside an emulsion, so it's just uh, oil water, you know, you mix it together, you get little beads, and each one of those little droplets in that oil emulsion acts like a PCR tube. Uh, so hopefully what you have in there is one of your templates and a bead, sometimes you have no bead, sometimes you have two templates, but this is the ideal. Uh, and then just by PCR, uh, you have a little oligo on there which uh, nucleates it, and then you basically coat the whole bead with that template. These are then loaded into a, what they call the Pico uh, titer plate, and this is a, basically a cluster of uh, glass capillaries that were fused together and then etched with acid to make these little tiny wells. And the beads fit into those wells, and they packed them in with, an, with other smaller beads. You do that just with a centrifuge, and on these beads or contained within these beads were the reagents to uh, do the sequencing. And this the sequencing occurred by uh, you flow in the, the base, and uh, if it's detected, uh, you get a, a, a light signal coming out, so you could detect the light. This is actually an electron micrograph of what the thing looked like. It still exists. You can still buy one. Oops. There it is. Uh, so the data that came out was very different than what we're used to. We're used to these traces, A, C, G, T coming off, uh, and this is what came out to us for the 454, where they're called flowgrams. Uh, this is just the amount of signals. So you flow each base in at a time. For example, here's a T. You're flowing in the T. 
uh, you get a signal, and this one's actually quite a, a large signal because it, it, if there's five T's in a row, it'll incorporate all five T's at a time and give you more signal. So the, the signal here, the, the amount of signal you got is, is proportional to the number of bases that you're incorporating to some extent. That's one of the weaknesses of the system, as you'll see. Then uh, came along, uh, this was, the, was really a company called Selexa, came out with a, an instrument which then bought by Illumina. Uh, in the original GA2, and they, what they did, they still couldn't uh, detect single molecules, but what they did instead of using beads is they did a, a little trick with the PCR right on the surface of a slide and built these little clusters, so it's just a way of increasing the signals that you could see. And their sequencing is done a little different, it's more akin to what we did with the, the Sanger-based sequencing, where it's, it's sequencing by synthesis, so all four bases are added at a time, but only one is, one is incorporated. Uh, so if you have a string of T's, only one T will be incorporated because it's blocked, and so the next base can't come in. You then wash away everything, you then image it with lasers, and uh, four different lasers, and get uh, the four different colors coming out, and then uh, you de-block that, add the next base, and continue. So it's, it's a, a cyclical sequencing, one base at a time. So it gets through those homopolymer repeats better. The data uh, that comes out was uh, a little more what we were kind of used to. So this, uh, this is hard to see, but what this is is uh, the, the plot of the signal from each one of those lasers. And quite often it's very clear. The, the one of them is the clear winner, and then uh, I think there's one over here that's not so clear where you know, you're getting two different signals, and so it's a little hard to tell which one it is. And that's where the, you, you'll see later as you're going through uh, data, and you'll see what's called a Q value, which is really telling you the quality of that base. These are going to be poor quality bases if you can't quite tell which one it is. So you, it's, a little higher, it's an A, but it still looks like it could be a G, and so it uh, gives you an error at that point. This is an old, an old picture I took, but uh, it's uh, useful because it just shows you the guts of these things and how simple it really was. This was the, the GA2. The imaging has changed. Oh, I got a new one in here. The imaging's changed, um, but uh, the system's really the same. But what this was when they built it was uh, really just a, an objective out of a microscope. So this, is, this whole part here is just a microscope. This is a slide with chambers in it. I brought visual aids. You haven't seen one, that's the slide. It's got little ports on one end and you can flow in the reagents across those eight channels, right? And in those channels are the, the oligos to which you, you bound your, uh, your template and so there's little tiny clusters in there. And it's, all it is then is it's got a laser, it can uh, uh, pick the laser and shine it across, and then image, and it just scans across with this imager. So it really was very, very simple. A little more complex now. It's a different. They've replaced the this part with a more complex uh, imaging system. There was competition in the industry, and competition is good. Uh, this uh, drove some of the prices down. But uh, this was uh, the uh, AV solid, which is pretty much dead, in my opinion. There's there are um, ones out there, and they're still supporting them, but uh, the newer ones don't work very well. But they did sort of a combination. They did that emulsion PCR and took a bead and put all the templates on it. They then modified the ends of the templates and then stuck them to the slide. So they stuck the beads down. The problem was sometimes they didn't stick and they floated away. Uh, they also had a, a completely different approach to sequencing. Instead of using a polymerase and adding one base at a time, they used a ligation method. So they had a, a very complicated series of, uh, I think there were nine MERS. Uh, and then they would ligate on and then cleave off that part and ligate on the next. And they really sequenced every fifth base. And then you'd, you'd offset by one and the sequence every fifth base. So instead of getting a linear progression through the sequence, you'd get base, you know, 1, 5, 10, and then you'd get 2, 6, 11. Uh, so you really had to wait to the end to put it all together. Um, third generation sequencers, uh, uh, including one. That really, the, the, that's almost anything else besides those is considered third generation, pretty much. Uh, but they had uh, particularly a focus on using um, single reads, you know, or single molecules. So you're not, you don't have to build those clusters anymore. Whenever you build those clusters, if there's any sort of PCR involved, you're introducing some kind of biases to your data, right? So you will definitely see that in the in the data. The GC content will be a little different than the the genome itself. So there's a lot of uh, push to get single molecule sequencers, and I include this one as a third generation, but it really came out at the same time as the others, and maybe, maybe a little ahead of its time, maybe a little too ahead of its time. Uh, this company just recently went into receivership. Um, this was uh, the Helicos uh, Heliscope. It's about, I'd say, the size of a refrigerator, maybe a little bigger. It weighs a ton, 
Uh, it had a cluster that also weighed a ton. We had to keep them on opposite sides of the room, according to the structural engineer, so it didn't fall through to the, the floor below us. But it, was a, it really was a single molecule sequencer, and they, had, they would tether uh, onto the, the, the slide their molecules and then sequence them. Uh, the problem with it really was that the read lengths were short. The error rates were uh, not bad. Uh, as you'll see, the, the PacBio is, has more errors, but they had about 5% error rate. Um, they, the main thing, you had to put, uh, you didn't get a lot of data out of it, you know, it just wasn't as much as we were expecting, and you had to put a lot of material in to get there. So, although it was a single molecule, it didn't catch on, it just wasn't able to really produce the amount of data that uh, it couldn't compete with the, the current systems. So another, th a truly third generation, I think, was the PAC bio system that came out, and this one's really kind of cool. Uh, this is a single molecule detection system. Uh, they have a, a thin membrane with a hole in it and a glass substrate underneath. This hole is, uh, I think, uh, seven zeptoliters, and it's 10 to the minus 21. And this hole is so small that light won't go through it. And the way the inventor described it to me was, um, if you look at a microwave, you know, you get that little grid on the front, you can see in, but the microwaves don't cook your face while you're watching your food cook or your popcorn pop. Um, so it's the same same principle. The microwaves are too big to come through those holes, so they don't come out and cook your face. And it's the same thing. So the laser light is too large to really go through the hole, but it does sort of light up this bottom area. And at the bottom of that, there's a polymerase and a single strand of, of DNA. And what you're actually watching then, this is, it's a cool instrument, what you're actually watching is that polymerase incorporate nucleotides. So this is just little cartoons. Uh, these are the nucleotides. They're floating around, Brownian, Brownian motion going in and out, and that's this chatter here as they go in and out of that little space on the bottom that where the interrogation is. Uh, and then every once in a while, the polymerase will decide to add a base, and it'll grab one and test it for fit. Uh, and if it fits, it'll incorporate it. And when it incorporates, that event takes on the, on the neighborhood of milliseconds. And so you see it traps it for a while. You can still see the other one drifting in and out. And then when it incorporates it, it cleaves off the floor, which is attached to the phosphates. So then it drifts away, goes back to baseline, next base going in. Of course, this is a cartoon. Data does not look like that, uh, that clean. Uh, you can have errors where the polymerases are not complete uniform, so they'll incorporate very quickly, and then it's hard to tell whether th those are multiple events or, or a single event. It also, uh, the other thing it can do is it can test it for fit, and even though it fits, it can let it go. And it, you have, have, have it there long enough. It looks like a base is incorporated, but one's not incorporated. And the major error rate that from this thing is that these are all uh, synthesized chemically, these compounds. Uh, and if there's no floor on it, it'll incorporate, but you won't get any signal at all. So those, you'll get a what we call a dark base, and so it looks like a deletion. But it, it worked pretty well. It had an error rate of uh, about 15% when they launched, which sounds huge, and, and it is huge. but uh, the read lengths are very long. Uh, right now, the read lengths are on uh, median uh, read length is about 5 kb, and you get reads out 20 kb or, or longer. So uh, it, if you've got 20 kb read, it doesn't matter if it's only 85% accurate. You can still do things with it. But we, we used it early on. We needed high accuracy because we used it for sequencing in the clinical setting. Uh, and you can get that out of this instrument by you put on these hairpin adapters, which makes a single-stranded uh, circle of DNA. And then when you sequence around that, the polymerase just keeps going around and around and around, and you get this long template coming out, which you can cut up informatically. And you basically get the forward read, reverse read, and you can go around, you know, we've had them go around 40 times. And so you get consensus sequence out of that, which is very accurate, right? So 99.99. Uh, so you can get accuracy out of the, out of the pack file. Another one that came along was the ion torrent, personal genome machine. Uh, this uh, was a bit of an upstart in that it uh, is, was completely different technology, so it was a non-light based, which was important, so it wasn't detecting floors anymore. Uh, right now, the read lengths are closer to 400 base pairs. This is sort of just a table of the outputs that you can, that they say you'll get and kind of what we're getting. So usually in the lower ones, we were getting more, and this one we're getting about what they say. But it worked very differently. More visual aid. I got one of these somewhere. So the things coming around is this chip, and this chip is is uh, is just a silicon wafer, and essentially it's an array of pH meters. So all these pH meters in the bottom, uh, you've got these little wells again. This is where your your bead. There's a, it does do an emulsion PCR, as you'll see, and the bead sits in there, and it's just a pH meter. And why is that pH meter useful? If the bead is sitting in the well, and uh, a piece a, a nucleotide is incorporated, 
as you incorporate a nucleotide, you release a proton. And as the protons are released, it changes the pH, and you can detect that event. Uh, they always, if you go to their website and everything, it always kind of looks like it's a single molecule, de molecule detection. It is not. Uh, it, uh, you can imagine trying to catch a, a single proton event wouldn't be very uh, useful. Um, so it's, it is a bead, does emulsion PCR. It also flows uh, one base at a time, so it, it's a, like the 454. And so it does incorporate, if there's five Ts, it'll incorporate five Ts, and you, sh you should get five times the signal. It is reasonably linear, but it is the, the Achilles heel of, of this platform. It, our our uh, homopolymer repeats, as you can see here, it has a little trouble deciding how many Ts there are when they get along, along above about five. It's getting much, much improved uh, on, the, uh, on the PGM. The next one that came along was the aluminum iSeq. This is, uh, um, I guess I skipped the high seek, but I'll get back to it. Uh, the MySeq, which was sort of a, a little brother to the Illumina platform. So the idea here was it would produce more data uh, in a shorter time. So the idea was, really was to get a sort of a 24-hour turnaround. Uh, you're getting less data overall than the, the, the big, big brother takes like four, two weeks to run, but you'd get uh, much more data. And the interesting thing about it was if you compared it when it came out, so this is old data, but it still, still applies. Um, when you compare it back when it came out in September to its bigger brother, uh, we try and always try apples and apples. It's, it's really sometimes tough, but it was pretty easy because of the same platform in this one. But obviously, uh, you look at things like uh, insert size distribution, you expect it to be the same. It's the same library, so there's no reason for it to be different. You can look at the percentage of reads that are aligning, so they're on target. So these are the green here, so you can see with the MySeq, we actually were getting more reads on target. And then you go into Y, so the number of indels per cycle are about the same. But here's the, where some of the difference was. So this is the quality value, or the Q value, for each cycle that's happening. It starts out above Q30 is where you want to be, above Q30. And so you can see it starts out pretty good. And then about 100 bases out, or about, this is probably right about 90 or something like that, it dropped below Q30, uh, same on, and then you do the reverse read. So you have to uh, take the other strand, you have to make the second strand of that template. And then uh, do it again. You see the data is usually a little worse on that second strand. This is the the MySeq data. This uh, this is going out to 150. If you can't read it, so instead of just out to 100, it's going to 150. And you can see it stayed up Q30 all the way out to 150. Uh, it dropped off a little bit here. So we're getting actually better reads off the the, the baby uh, the baby machine. And and that was I'm not sure anyone really knows why we still do, but I, I think it's mainly because of the reagents. And it's a 24-hour turnaround versus a two-week. Around. So the reagents are only on the machine for 24 hours instead of two weeks. Uh, so that's probably the big difference. And then you can do a 250 base pair read on the MySeq, but somewhere around, um, oh, I don't know, about 175 or something like that, the quality starts really dropping. Uh, so we, you, you can do it. You can get a 250 base pair read, but I think still the 150 is, is much more useful. This is the the new big brother of the PGM, the ion proton. Um, it has short run time. A couple years ago when it first was being discussed, they were promising the thousand dollar genome. I'll get into that in a minute. Uh, but it produces what they're, they're saying it'll produce is around 10 gigs of data uh, on the, the initial version that's come out. And then the next chip that comes out, uh, they're saying about 60 gigs. And that chip going around is, is from the PGM. Uh, it's very similar. It's the same technology, just more more uh, little pH meters on it, and it's a bigger chip uh, to try and get more out of it. And this is what uh, they are hoping that eventually, this is where you'll be able to get sort of a genome in a few hours. But I think it's got a lot of development time to go to it. The data coming off this are actually not as good as the PGM, the little brother one, uh, but it, it it'll improve. So the High Seek 2500 is probably the latest entry. It's very similar to. The other one, but it's uh, this is a, an upgrade, or you can buy the instrument outright. And um, this one will produce either it runs two different modes. It can either sort of in 24 hours or 27 hours produce about 120 gigs of data, which would be about a 40x coverage in the human genome, uh, or you can flip it over to the other mode, which is the usual way of running it over a course of, uh, of about 14 days or 10 days, a little longer, 14 days, get around 600, 700 gigs of data. You can do a little longer read on the short and then you can on the long, again, for the quality of the reagents that are on. So if you want to do fast turnaround and fast genomes, you can do this. The, you'll see that the uh, chip that's coming around only has two channels on it, so it only loads two channels. There are two flow cells, two of those on, on board, so you can do two different samples. 
but uh, you're committed to that and you get a little less data and they also charge you a little more for the reagents and so it's about a 15% premium but if you need an answer fast it's quite useful and still on the horizon has been on the horizon for a long time are nanopore technologies and Oxford nanopore is, is one of them uh, this is where they actually use a protein pore and the DNA as it passes through so you can measure the, the potential across this membrane and as the DNA goes through you can get changes in the signal and what they're really detecting is about three bases that block the pore and get and that's where you get the signal change from um, they haven't launched yet they are getting close to I think some betas out there uh, they the problem they've had with is with accuracy in that they can't distinguish all of these three three uh, nucleotide words as they call them um, between them all so they and the difference between that and the Pacific uh, Biosciences one is that they're not random errors. If they can't distinguish this triplet from another triplet, they can't say what it is, whereas the PAC biologists do more coverage and the errors go away. But it's, it's pretty cool technology. This is uh, one of their latest sequencers. It looks like my half terabyte thumb drive, a little bigger. Uh, and that plugs into your computer, and that's actually a, where the sequencing would be done. Uh, and then you can also fill up just almost like a cluster. You can fill up racks of these things uh, with the uh, with these cartridges you stick in with the pores. So uh, they didn't say much this year. At AGBT is uh, sort of one of the major meetings for genomics and sequencing. Uh, this is what they said uh, two years ago. This year they were pretty quiet. They didn't say very much. So we're all still waiting for them to, to come up. All right, so you can see that uh, it's a very complex space. And what instrument you, you use, or I get asked a lot from people, is, well, what instrument should I buy? And it does depend on what your project is and what you want to do. So it's really unknown where these guys are going to fall in here. Uh, but if you want lots of data and you don't mind waiting uh, 10 days to 14 days, then you want to be in this range. It depends on how much money you have to spend, too. These are expensive. They're around $650,000 instruments. Um, if you want fast turnaround but not a lot of data, you can use the pack bio. Uh, for some applications, especially if you need long reads, uh, this is about seven hundred fifty thousand uh, dollars. This one was brought in just because it's reasonably cheap. Uh, you could probably get in to sequencing for about two hundred thousand once you buy it, everything you need to do it. Uh, I have no idea what they're charging for these anymore. Uh, probably about one hundred fifty thousand, but they produce a lot less data. Uh, so somewhere in here, it, it, where are you going to be uh, is depending on your project. And it, just to put in perspective a little bit where we are in sequencing. So this is at the time, just near the, just after the end of the Human Genome Project survey, the peak of the genome centers. This is, I was a co-director here and then I was here as well, uh, these two genome centers. And we had rooms full of these, these instruments that were the capillary sequencers. And we could produce around, between the two centers, around 10 million reads or about 5 billion bases a month. And now one of these things will produce about 360 times that and take probably two people to run. Right? So the, all of these people were involved. A lot of bioinformatics is all in here and everything. But that just puts it in scale of where we're at with data. The other thing that happened a lot was the, pipe, the price dropped. And we've all heard about, you know, the $1,000 genomes coming. So when, right at the beginning of the next gen uh, introduction, it was about $10 million to sequence the genomes. The price had dropped a, a lot for Sanger-based sequencing. And, and then when this came in, uh, you could do about $10 million. And it's been dropping pretty steadily, as you can see. Uh, what, when people talk about a thousand dollar genome, they're really only talking about reagents. They're not talking about everything else, the, the getting the sample, the personnel to run it, informatics, as you'll see, is a big part of it here. Uh, sample prep, maintenance agreements. My maintenance agreements are, are 1.2 million dollars a year, so I have to take that into account. So what makes the first sequence so expensive compared to the rest? Which one? The 10 million one. Well, part, there's a couple of reasons for that. Oops. So the question is, why was it why was it 10 million? Why has the price been dropping, basically? So the biggest problem here was the amount of data you got out of the machine. So you didn't get a lot. I mean, the, the first next gens were impressive. They'd make you 100,000 reads at 100 base pairs long, which was very impressive at the time. It's not so impressive now. Uh, so in order to do a genome, you'd have to do a lot of those runs. And because they were new and on the market, they charged a lot. They didn't. There wasn't much competition, so they charged a lot for the reagent. So that was the cost. As more instruments came in, uh, competition was one of the things that drove the price down. The other was the yield per instrument, the amount for each run, how much data would you get. 
and now we're we're getting a high seek about 700 gigs of data off a single single run off it right and uh, the they didn't the price has gone up a little bit but they didn't uh, it wasn't proportional so as we got more data they didn't charge us proportionally more and so the the cost went down we're in a point here I think we bottomed out at least for a while until there's some new dis disruptive technology that comes in and really forces them to compete there's really no competition for Illumina Illumina is pretty much doing what they want right now and in fact the the if you were to draw the curve on reagents it actually goes up a little bit so they basically they've reduced the discounts that we get for bulk purchasing and so the our costs have actually gone up about five percent this year but so I think we've kind of bottomed out but it's the thing is that sequencing is not the driver in your experiments anymore um, if you're gonna pool 100 samples in one lane the cost per sequencing is nothing it's like 70 bucks but you have to make a hundred libraries and those libraries are going to be the driving force for sure so they always talk about just sequencing reagents and we're a long way from a thousand dollar gene so applications you're going to be going through them uh, on the informatics side but uh, pretty much everything that was done by any other means such as arrays has been ported over to sequencing arrays are still quite useful they're still cheap uh, but you can do you know copy number from the data structural variation uh, you can do of course call uh, SNPs and indels small RNAs uh, epigenomics there's methylation mentioned you can do that do that you can also do a, a chip chip uh, and also transcriptome sequencing so uh, you'll get see many examples of that in throughout the week this is an old slide it was the first uh, cancer genome sequenced it was a uh, AML this was done at WashU and I, I just keep it in there because the numbers haven't changed that much if you sequence uh, anyone in the room and uh, their whole genome and compare it to the reference sequence you'll see about two and a half million differences between the, the reference and then for cancer sequencing all you really care about are the ones that were somatic and you might find uh, you know somewhere in the round of 60 to 30,000 depends on the cancer type uh, and then you see you what everyone does is just look at the genes you keep filtering it down filtering it down and for many tumor this is this is the false positive rate was pretty high uh, but AMLs are actually, or leukemias are actually pretty simple in their overall context. But you'll find by the time you filter this down, you'll end up with, depending on the tumor type, let's say 100 coding uh, non-synonymous uh, changes that you, you want to look at. Uh, a little bit about uh, targeting. So if you want to capture certain regions, such as uh, the exome, for example, uh, and you have to define what the exome is. There's a lot of companies that offer exome. Uh, Agilent and uh, NimbleGen and Illumina also but if you were to look at those uh, what they define in exome they're all different so be careful on when you're when you're picking one make sure you look at the content that they provide uh, and make sure the regions you want are covered this just shows you the, the data is quite good this is kit one of the oncogene and uh, this is targeting with the Agilent system and you can see that the reads fall primarily uh, the scale here if you were to zoom way in you would see that there are reads that are off target but uh, majority of the reads are on target and get pretty good coverage uh, and fairly uniform, relatively uniform coverage of all the exomes. So that's if you want the whole exome. Oops. There are reasons you might not want the whole exome. So if you're sequencing the whole exome, uh, you have to sequence it to a certain depth. Uh, and you could probably put, well, people put as many as four of them in a single lane on a, on a high seek. We actually only do one because in the cancer, uh, we want to go very deep. Uh, but probably you could get away with two so you only put two per lane but if you just want to sequence 100 genes you can put many many per lane right so there's you know, other technologies for that uh, and one of them is the uh, the rain dance this is a multiplex PCR so this is very uh, very very high throughput uh, PCR it's kind of like emulsion PCR except that they've pre-made the little bubbles so they take the oligos and synthesize them they package them up in little bubbles and then they mix them all together to make your library of all these little oligos then you combine your, your sheared DNA with the primers and then down here the two little bubbles get fused and then basically just dumps them out into a PCR tube and you cycle it so it's an emulsion PCR at that point but what they've done is they've uh, instead of that sort of randomness of whether you what you have in each of the, the little bubbles they, they're very controlled here so they've got a when you get a, bring a bubble together you will have some DNA and some primer uh, from your library in every single bubble so the efficiency is quite good this just shows some of the coverage and it's dependent on how much sequencing you want to do but this is just using that rain dance uh, the coverage is quite good you can see uh, 100x coverage of over 95 percent of the target 
There's other methods that are, are available. Haloplex, so Halo Genomics was bought by Agilent, uh, and uh, they can offer this. So the, all of these sites, they, you can go to a website, you can put in your targets, and they have a design tool, and they'll tell you, you know, estimate what the coverage is. This one is uh, they use a, a pool of restriction enzymes and cut the DNA, and then they ligate on a, an adapter that is specific to those, those sticky ends uh, for the regions you want, and these adapters actually overlap into the, the region of uh, your targets to get the complementary, and then fills it in, and then you can PCR it. And it, so it then uh, fits right nicely onto a, a MySeq. So this is an example. This is 19 genes only. This is one of their first panels that they came out. It was only a 61 KB target, and you could very easily uh, put it on a MySeq and pool 10 or more samples because you get right back then we we're getting about two gigs of data uh, and very high mapping on target. Uh, so you get this whole step. So you can go from from here, get your DNA to getting data out in two or three days. So it's a bit of a game changer. And the coverage was quite good. Same sort of thing. Here's about 100x coverage. Uh, one my uh, run. Now you get much more coverage. This curve would be out there, but you got very good coverage. Uh, this line here, that the poor coverage is actually mouse. We threw that in just to, to make sure because we were doing xenografts to make sure that the the mouse did not also, also uh, uh, give much product. Ampliseq is another one. This is uh, from LifeTech uh, and is designed specifically to go on the ion torrent platforms, but uh, you can run it on any, with a little tweak, you can run any platform you want. I didn't normalize these two because I just want to show you that uh, this is a, an FFP sample in blood, and so there's less data generated for the FFPE, but so I didn't bother normalizing this to one to the other. So we got, just the reason the red's higher is we just had more reads, more coverage, right? But the thing to notice is that the, the coverage is not uniform. That this is their version one. Version two, it's better, but it still has this problem where it's not very uniform. But you can see it's reproducible. If you just look at the two colors, and pretty much wherever one is, they're proportionally the same. So this is just the, you know, this is giant multiplex PCR. Uh, I think they can do 4,000 or something like that in one tube. And uh, you, you can imagine that the, each primer pair is not as, uh, not quite as efficient as the other. So it's getting better, but still be aware that the uh, when you, when you talk about coverage, I don't know what the average coverage, well, here's the average coverage. So we got an average coverage on the FFB that looks good, around 500x, but, you know, that's here. And you can see, right, there's a lot of areas that are below it because that average is being skewed by some of these ones that are very uh, greatly covered. All right, so enough of methods. So cancer genome projects. A typical cancer genome project, you get some normal DNA, frequently blood. You get some tumor DNA. You sequence it. Magic happens here, doing all the identification, and you do a bunch of people, and you look for some sort of commonalities. You're looking for genes that are frequently mutated, or more importantly, pathways that are mutated. And what are the, some of the complexities of that? Well, you know, cancer disease is the genome, and it starts out as a normal genome, and then you get mutations occurring, and the mutations that give it a, a growth advantage, so you drive it forward. There are mutations that can obviously happen and kill the cells, so some will drop out. But as it progresses, you can get new drivers appearing, and what you end up with in the end is something that's very complex in that uh, the genome itself is uh, rearranged. It has multiple copies of various chromosomes. So here's three chromosome two and with a bit of something else on it. Um, and then the, the, just the whole population now is not uniform. So now you have this heterogeneous population you have to deal with. And you have sensitivity issues in that this is a pancreatic tumor, actually, and you can see that there's a lot of other stuff here besides tumor, so the stroma in here, and that affects then uh, your ability to, to sequence that. So if you were to grind this up and sequence it, uh, you would find that, let's say, it look, I won't go through all of these, but down here, for example, in a, let's say the, the genome, the ploidy of it is normal, so it hasn't got much uh, structural stuff going on, but it's only 20 percent tumor in your sample. Your signal is only 10 percent. So you, if you find a, a somatic variant, is only going to be in 10 percent of the reads, right? so 90 percent are becoming from the, the normal, uh, and so that now you're you're down, and as you'll see as you go through all this this course, that uh, detecting down around 10 percent, that's not so bad, but you do want to go a little bit below that if this sample is heterogeneous, uh, you're starting to get into noise, and your false positive rate goes up greatly. And there's some great papers. This is from WashU. Uh, that uh, followed some of this. So this is, uh, again, this is in leukemias, um, which are much more simple and easier to follow initially. But uh, and this, I think the OB might be the one behind these figures, I'm not sure. 
but uh, these these uh, clearly show that in the original uh, diagnosis there was a, a number of cells that various uh, cell types at various portions. So the sample was heterogeneous to begin with, and then the patient was treated, and so it goes through a bottleneck, and so some of the cells uh, die off and some don't, and this one in particular here came on and stayed, but also continued to mutate, and so now you get even more heterogeneity, but the population changed between here and here. So there's a lot of studies ongoing now looking at the differences at diagnosis and relapse uh, as to what's going on. But it, it, the main point there is that the heterogeneity is, is uh, going to be your enemy in, in many of the analysis you want to do. All right, so variant detection, just talking about that for a second. There are two things to consider. One is, so you align all the reads. You call the variance, the differences between the reference. If you're looking at germline, uh, roughly you're going to see 50% uh, 50-50 of a, a heterozygous uh, uh, variant within the pop within your, your patient sample. You should see roughly a 50-50 mix of uh, forward and reverse reads. Those are relatively easy to call. If you're looking at paired end data, so this is a you know one one read here, and this would be its mate going the other way. Most of the paired ends will fall around uh, you know a Poisson distribution, but you'll get some outliers here. And from those outliers, you can uh, start looking at structural variations. Easy to think about as a translocation, where one, one of your reads is on one chromosome and one's on the other chromosome, indicating a translocation. You wouldn't want to do that with one pair. You'd get multiple pairs that all say the same thing uh, to get some evidence to what you're looking at. But there are lots of problems in the data, and you'll, you'll be going through some of those. Uh, first one, obviously, is PCR. We talked about a lot of these processes are PCR-based, so making the libraries. Uh, you can do a PCR-free library, but uh, typically there are some PCR steps involved. And then when you make the clusters on those those things I sent around, um, they uh, those little clusters uh, are PCR-based as well. And so you'll see reads that start at this exact same place. And what we do is we look at pairs, and, and if both the pairs start and stop at the same place, we assume it's the same template. We collapse that down, get rid of them. But there's PCR artifacts. You'll see little, the biggest problem is misaligned reads. So the aligner puts something in the wrong place, and it looks like it's creating a variant. And if it does that often enough, then you, you really start to get evidence that it's a variant. And it's not consistent. And so if, if it happens more in your tumor sample than your normal sample, then they, they kind of look like somatics, especially if you're trying to call things down around 10%. And some of the things you can see that help you identify them are strand bias. So you only see the variant on one strand and not on the other. Or you see clusters like this, you know, where you see one read's got three different variants in it. You don't want to blindly filter all those out. Some of those are real, but those are the things to watch out for. Uh, okay, I've already covered all that. There are some tricks. So there's a, about three different papers out doing very similar things. This is just one of them, where if you incorporate a random tag at your at this point when you're making your libraries and when you do all your your PCR and sequencing, these random tags then will indicate. So if you see things that start and stop at the same place then clearly, uh, and the random tags are the same, then you collapse them, you say they're the same thing. And if the random tags are different, then you'll say they're independent templates and you can keep them. And it, this allowed them to go much deeper in what they were able to call because they, they could really have independent events. You can see that one of the uh, things you really have to think about is if you're doing those targeted sequencing with PCR, every read starts and stops at the same place, right? So you can't just, you can't collapse unless you do something like this in Amplicon sequencing. All right, so we've got uh, cheap sequencing, relatively cheap sequencing, uh, relatively easy, high throughput. Uh, and so the, this is around 2007. This is when things really started to take off, this is when uh, Illumina launched. Uh, the idea was then, okay, well, let's, uh, let's see what we can do to really push the cancer genomics forward. So there was a meeting uh, held in Toronto here uh, to talk about it. And the idea was, you know, should we try and coordinate internationally uh, cancer efforts? And there's a lot of reasons for that. The one I, I'm most interested in myself is this one, where if we could standardize the, you know, how we do our variant calling, uh, which I, I don't know if you're, someone's going to talk about that, like this, but I'm not. Uh, if, if the bottom line of that is if multiple, you give people the same reads in different centers and they all call them, they'll all get different answers right now, which. Yeah, okay, yeah. It was, it's an interesting, when you look at the data, you'd be absolutely amazed how different they are from this, how the calls are from the same data, using the same pipelines. But if we can standardize and agree to uh, not only the 
sort of the what what is quality and how to uh, put these on, we'll be able to merge data sets across cancers types very readily. And so they, out of that meeting what came uh, the idea that, yeah, it would be a good idea to coordinate. And frequently that's all that happens in those meetings. Is, but uh, this actually did end up with a consortium that was formed. Uh, and uh, the goal of the consortium was to sequence about 50 different tumor types and uh, the, their controls and do about 500 for each one. So it was like doing 50,000 human genome projects, but it was doable. And now there, there's, uh, I forgot the number of countries involved, I think there's 39 projects. Do you know, Francis, how many countries are in it? Uh, 52, 51. Projects in 39 countries, I think. Okay, I'm saying correct. It's 17 countries. Uh, but this this is a list of all of the. Yeah, this is the list of all the projects. Uh, this is Canada. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the pancreatic project. Uh, we're also doing a prostate project, and uh, uh, medulloblastoma. And I will point out that Australia is also doing a pancreatic project, uh, and doing the same uh, tumor types that we coordinate uh, quite closely. There's a website if you want to go here. You can get access to the data that's been deposited. It's a growing amount of data. Uh, TCGA, the Cancer Genome Atlas in the U.S., is part of the ICGC, and their data is deposited in here as well uh, and mirrored from their site. Uh, you can go and pick any of the projects and find out more about it, who's doing it, what their goals are, et cetera. So just really briefly, the, the OICR is just up the street. It actually looks like this now. <laughs> this is uh, an artist drawing. This with building was, uh, has been on the go for five years now or something like that. Yeah, they wouldn't look at this at night right now. Um, but uh, it, got, it got delayed. We're moving into the fifth and sixth floors of this uh, from our current space here. We'll keep that space. But uh, this has been a long time coming. But it actually looks like that now if you go up to Point the corner. To My office is right there. <laughs> I, get, I get the nice corner office. Just, I, it was just given to me. So there's, uh, the OICR has a, a lot of programs in it. Um, I'm going to talk mostly about um, uh, genome technologies and uh, the bioinformatics, biocomputing, a little bit about the high-impact clinical trials. But it does cover everything, and you're, what you're interested in is, is the cancer genomics and infra, you know, this part of it. But behind all that, there is um, you know, immunotherapies, a medicinal chemistry group, which is taking some of the uh, targets and uh, turning them into better drugs. Imaging is a big program, how to detect things earlier in uh, new ways. Uh, even just epidemiology, we have a, a big Ontario health study go ongoing, so pretty much cover all ends of it right down to the clinical trials. Okay, so to show you what we have, these are my toys. So this, this is uh, what the genome technology platform looks like. We have 10 uh, high seeks, uh, two of which are 2500s. We could do roughly 650 whole genomes a year on that platform. We've got two of the MySeqs, which are the fast turnaround ones. Uh, we have a PacWow, which is the long read uh, technology. Ion torrents, we've got a couple of those, and we've got we do have a Proton. Uh, that's we haven't run that yet; it's just been installed. Uh, but uh, this we have this various platforms. This is an obvious one for it, long reads, different applications. Uh, but it's nice when you're doing verification, so you can do your sequencing, call variants, and you get a list of them all. And there will be false, false positives in there for sure. And so one thing you like to do is then go back and use a different technology to uh, analyze them. Because the cleaner the data are up front, the, the cleaner the data are out the back, and so it will make your informatics a lot easier. So we tend to do that on a, a separate uh, program. So we'll do something like uh, whole genome sequencing here, discover a bunch of variants. We'll then order an AmpliSeq reagent to amplify across those samples, and then uh, we'll sequence them on the ion torrent. And if we see the same variant, it gives us the warm and fuzzy feeling that we've actually called something correctly. I should point out, this is our, our uh, compute, about 8,000 cores. Uh, we have uh, three and a half petabytes of storage, which sounds like a lot, but it's not. We're always trying to delete things. All right, so pancreatic cancer, I'll just give you a, a brief overview of one of our projects. Um, when we, the ICG, ICGC started, we had to decide what cancer type we were going to do. Uh, we chose pancreas because there's quite a bit of local expertise in that. The hospital next to us is one of the primary sites in Ontario for doing the, what's called a Whipple operation, which is the, the primary uh, surgical curative form for uh, pancreatic cancer. Uh, they do that. They, they centralize Ontario, if you're not from here or not from Canada, um, is a single-payer system, so there's 14 million people roughly all under one healthcare system. 
And what they do is they've, they've localized certain care in certain areas, so pancreatic whipples, uh, the primary site is right up the street here, and uh, they just find that the, the more whipples you do, the better you get and the better for the patients. Uh, so we, we get access to a lot of samples, but we decided to go for that. And because of that local expertise, it's also, it has a five-year survival of about two to five percent. So it's, it's one of the most lethal, lethal cancers. Uh, it's only, it's not that common, but it's one in 50 cases, new cases. But because it, its survival is so poor, it actually accounts for six percent of cancer deaths and is, I think, the number fifth killer uh, after the common ones. And one of the reasons is when people uh, come in and, and are... Uh, are ill and they're trying to diagnose them and they find out only about 15% of them are candidates for surgery because the rest of them it's already too advanced and even with that the, the mean uh, lifespan is only about 15 to 20 months. Uh, if it's locally advanced they really can't do much there's major blood vessels come together right there and if it's wrapped around those they can't do surgery uh, and they, they last about a year but 60% come in and it's already metastatic and it's too late and they, these, these tumors do not respond very well to drugs Gemcitabine is one of the, the primary ones used, but not very many people actually respond to it. So we needed uh, samples. Um, I apologize for some of the going over your, your template slides, kind of mess some things up. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so one thing you need for any of these projects, this should be 375 here, uh, is uh, lots of samples and lots of good samples. And with the ICGC, we want a specific consent for DNA sequencing. So that eliminates a lot of the old samples, right? Because uh, uh, historically, people collected things and didn't, didn't even think they'd be doing whole genome sequencing. So we had to start collecting from the beginning. So we had to reach out to several centers uh, and uh, uh, to collect as many samples as we could. Our, our target was 375. Australia was doing 375. Uh, for that project then combined, we'd have 750. So we did a, pretty much set up a typical project. Uh, we had uh, primary tumors resected. We got uh, uh, biobank from usually uh, blood from the biobank for our germline, sometimes adjacent tissue. But these are all the 15% the of the, the, the cases that were surgically resected. We tried to capture all of them that came through. Uh, then we did exome. We've done whole genome sequencing, looking for structural variants, copy number, transcriptome, epigenetics, all the things you're going to do. But when we started doing the project, it became clear that although we could get samples, we couldn't get really good samples. So pancreatic cancer and prostate cancer is the same, are difficult to deal with because of the cellularity. So we talked about that before, how it affects your sensitivity, in that the, the amount of tumor in the sample is actually quite small. And this is just a subset of our, our tumors, but it rep it's representative of our entire spectrum. This is 20%, this red line. So all of these tumors are less than 20% cellularity. Right? And so uh, your signal is only 10%, and forget about heterogeneity. Uh, even 40%, you can see almost all of them are less than 40%. And we, there's a mixing experiment done, so we just took a, a cell line, and it's matched normal, and mixed them together at various proportions. And we knew by sequencing the cell line sort of what the ground truth was, and we looked to see could we, what could we detect of those ones we knew were in there. And you can see right around here at 20%, we're we only to picking up about 40 or about half of the variants that we knew were there in our pipelines. So obviously, uh, all these samples here are going to be very, especially down here, very difficult, very high false negative rate. But we, we pushed on with it because that's all we had at the time. We, as I said, we're collaborating with uh, uh, Australia. Also, Baylor College of Medicine was doing pancreatic sequencing, so we hooked up with them. And the, between the three of us, we uh, did an analysis on about 90 samples, and that was published at the end of last year. It's a typical project that you see. So the, these are sort of the known uh, drivers in pancreatic cancer here at this end. Uh, we saw those, of course, and then you get this long tail. Right? These are all things that are in about, you know, maybe 5% of the cases. Uh, and this is a typical of any sequencing project right now. Uh, and the, the, clue, the, the thing we've got to figure out is what does this long tail mean? Uh, these are any of these drivers, or they can't all just be passengers because there's, there's, they're too common. But and it could be subtypes. So we're starting, to, we think we're starting to see subtypes of uh, pancreatic cancer. Uh, it was going into it, we had no idea how many subtypes there might be. There was a study done in 2008, which was a pretty heroic effort. Actually, this was a, a straight PCR-based and Sanger-based sequencing uh, of of the exome. Uh, and this is from Hopkins, and they did, they did this on several cancers, but they did it on pancreatic. They did 24 samples. They were largely uh, cell lines or xenografts, or were all cell lines or xenografts, 
uh, for reasons uh, become apparent in a minute. Uh, so we compared ourselves with that. And the red here are the things that they saw, and we also saw in a significant proportion of our samples. The black ones are ones only the ones that they saw, and the blue ones are things that we saw. Now, why did we see more? Well, we did more samples, but I think uh, largely it's also because uh, this is all based on primary tumors, whereas theirs are all cell lines and xenografts, so it could be some bias in selection of what grows in those, those systems. But this is, these were all done in primaries. And I won't you can read the paper if I won't go through the details, but uh, we did actually find something new in, in uh, pancreatic cancer was the axonal guidance pathway. It seemed to come up as one that was being frequently hit. And there was also some evidence uh, from other uh, functional assays that also would show that these are important genes in this pathway to, to give some credence to that it actually, um, there was actually a uh, axonal guidance pathway involved. And uh, slit, slits and, and robos and in the axon guidance pathway were already known in cancer. So they're in lung cancer, they were, uh, they'd been seen as being mutated. And in our own data, it made a lot, these, some of the things made sense. This is again more evidence that this seemed to be uh, on the right track in that this, this the pathway here, robo one, uh, signals downstream for decreased cell adhesion, increased went activity, increased cell motility, uh, all things that cancers like to do. So you can see over here, if robo-2 expression is high, uh, the, the patient's, I'm going to get that backwards, I know it. No, sorry, it inhibits that. Yes, robo-2 inhibits that. Uh, so if, if its expression is high, then uh, the patients do better, right? And if it's low, then it's not, not inhibiting this, these pathways, then the, the patients do more poorly. And robo-3 is an inhibitor of robo-2, and so if robo-3 expression is high, you see them flip. So this made sense in, a, in our patient data set. So it does seem to be an important pathway. All right, so enrichment. We talked about sensitivity. So this, again, is that same pancreatic cancer sample. Uh, and you can see that most of it's not cancer in this one uh, that we want to study. So we tried doing things like uh, you can just take a, a slice off the top, do an H&E stain, look for a region that's got the most tumor in it, punch it out with a biopsy core, uh, and then try and sequence that. It didn't help much in pancreatic cancer. It's uniformly bad, so almost where you punch it, you don't get much advantage. So you get 5 or 10% increase, but it's still not enough. Uh, you can use antibodies to, uh, for cell surface markers. To, uh, this has got xenografts in it as well, but you can have fresh and frozen. So you can take uh, markers that are specific to epithelium, which is where the, the tumors derive from, and you can pull it down. That, that worked somewhat. It's, uh, uh, it has its own issues. The, the tumor may not be expressing that cell surface marker anymore. You maybe just pull out subsets. So we uh, introduced into our project xenografts. So this is where you take the primary tumor, put it in a mouse, and grow it up. Uh, from those, can also derive some cell lines. So it gave us more, more reagents. It is, uh, we, we, we believe, or we, we hope, that the primary tumor and the xenograft are quite representative of each other. They will be different. This is something that's growing up in a mouse, right? So it is different. Um, so we, we hopefully we get more material would help because we can grow up as much as we want. Uh, it also, importantly, we're trying also to develop preclinical models. So these are models now that once we've sequenced the tumor and it grows in the mouse, we could, uh, and we find a pathway like axonal guidance and we've got a drug that can hit it, we can go to the mouse and actually try and uh, uh, prevent the tumor growth. And did it work? Yeah, it works. Uh, I'm not a pathologist, but they tell me that the, so this is the primary tumor here and in the mouse you can see there's a lot more tumor tissue, but, uh, and they say, they tell me that the morphology is very similar, but I'll take their word for it. But did it, did it work for us? Did it help? So this is a, an example of sequencing um, uh, in primary tumors and xenografts and cell lines, and this is just looking at KRAS, which is pretty much a universal um, uh, mutation in pancreatic cancer. Uh, there are exceptions, about 3% of them don't have KRAS mutations, but 97% uh, do. And you can see in sequencing the primary, just in our pipeline, did we detect the KRAS mutation? You know, about half of them, like I said. In the xenografts, we detected always, and in the cell lines, we detected always. So clearly there was an enrichment going on. If you go back and look at the raw data, for example, here, there was uh, 227 reads covering the KRAS locus. Three of them showed the mutation, but it's way below what our pipelines could call. So there wasn't definitely an enrichment. One of the problems that came along with that was uh, Pancreatic cancer doesn't like to grow as like just a lump of tumor. It likes to grow with all interdigitated with the stroma, and so it recruited most tissue for stroma. 
and you can see this is the estimated amount of mouse tissue that's in there. So we had a, another problem now. Instead of, although we didn't have normal human tissue in there, we've got a lot of mouse tissue. And what we found, of course, then is a, a lot of your reads don't align to the human genome, so you're just doing a lot of sequencing that you're throwing away. But more importantly, this is a region of alignment here. Reads are nicely aligning to the region. Uh, these are just random errors. You can see a few of them, so it's a nice, clean sequence. And you can very clearly see a variant here, right? Roughly, I don't know what the percentage is here. It looks like almost 50%. Um, and so uh, you'd call that as a variant, a, a T to G variant at that position. If you were to compare the 100 bases around that and align it to the human and mouse, lines quite well. And the only difference between the two is that T to G. So these are just mouse reads aligning to the, the human genome. Uh, and then the variant caller sees that as a single variance. And so we had this problem with the mouse. So we sequence mouse again. And then using that, that data, we aligned. So we just took the mouse genome, sequenced it, aligned it to the human genome, ran through our pipeline. And you get around 1% or so of the mouse genome that aligns, which isn't very much. But it does preferentially align, as you'd expect, to the exome, more conservation in the genes. And if you just run it through your pipeline and call SNPs, you'll call somewhere between 300 and 600,000 or so, you know, half a million of these, what we call interspecies SNPs. So these are things that are going to come through our pipeline. Now, if you're comparing to a normal and a xenograft, they're going to look like somatics, right, because they're only in the tumor sample. So we had to develop pipelines to filter that out. This is just one. This is showing if you just called with our pipeline and then after removing all the ones that we knew were most. And we also now are getting much better at actually uh, informatically uh, removing this. Uh, we use a software package called Xenome, which actually uh, uses KMER analysis and removes the mouse reads. And it works quite well. So we're, the data is getting much cleaner, but I still think we have some bleeding through. All right, so laser capture and flow sorting. These are our two techniques to get at the tissue. So if this is a, a tumor, and we can just pull out the parts of the tumor and ignore the rest, or we can sort it and uh, get out pure, pure uh, tumor. Uh, that's great. Is, is the problem solved? Not really. Um, when we first started out sequencing, you needed microgram quantities of DNA to, to sequence. So, uh, you know, if you're going to sequence a mouse, for example, you take a snip off the tail and you, the original pipeline would take about 10 micrograms going in. Uh, now, typically, if it's an automated pipeline, you need three micrograms. But from these, these sorts of biopsies here, you know, it's like a, a fine needle aspirate or if we're going to do laser capture and take specific regions or we're just going to take pieces off a, an FFP block, you're looking at nanogram quantities. And the, there was a big misfit there uh, between the, the two pipelines. So we could, we could get material, but we couldn't get enough to do real whole genome sequencing. We get enough to do targeted, you know, that would be fine, do a few genes. But if we really want to sequence the whole genome, there just didn't, there wasn't enough material. So we spent quite a bit of time working on that in my group. Um, so right now, as it said, somewhere in here, I think it says, yeah, it's about three micrograms. So if we have a automated, you know, robotic pipeline that'll that'll make libraries for us, but there's a lot of waste in in the robotic pipeline. So we need about three micrograms going into that. We'll never get that from these uh, flow sorting and, and uh, laser capture. We also had a the prostate uh, biopsy project that we're doing. They typically could give us 100 nanograms. We didn't know that when we started the project, but uh, that's what they started giving us 100 nanograms. Uh, the flow sorting we're looking at thousands of cells. We're also interested in circulating tumor cells. We'll talk a little about that later. Uh, that we've been requested uh, several projects for single cell analysis. Clearly, this would have to be amplified, but still, there's not a lot of material. And with the FFP, which is the bulk of the samples that are out there in the world, um, there you get low amount and, and poor quality DNA out of those. So we had to put a lot of effort into that. And we can routinely take 50 nanograms and make a library, that, a really good quality library, uh, by hand. And uh, but it's it is a manual process, so it's it hard to do lots of them. Uh, formalin fixed, paraffin embedded. So most of the cancer samples out there, the big collections are like this. So the, the sample comes out, the pathologist drops it in formalin, which is a terrible thing to do from the nucleic acid side. Uh, but it, uh, it holds the structure and what they're used to looking at. They embed it in, in paraffin. And the one, actually, the one back here, how oh, far back I have to go. There. This, yeah. there. this one actually, this is uh, embedded in a thing called OCT, which is the optimal cutting temperature. Uh, so it just it freezes at a temperature that allows the tissue to be sliced very nicely, but the pathologists don't, won't use that because the morphology is a little different. 
And if they're trying to do a diagnosis, they want what they're used to. And what they're used to is FFPE. Uh, so this is the formula and fixed and, and then paraffin embedded. You'll find if you are working with these samples, um, which is really the bulk of the collections out there, if they're older than about 10 years, you'll get really poor data out of them, uh, really hard to make libraries from them. Uh, if they're three to five years old, you can get pretty decent stuff out of them. And that's not, has really nothing to do with age. It has more to do with um, the way they, they process the samples. So formula is terrible to DNA and RNA. Uh, it cross-links it. it breaks it up, uh, but uh, and about 10 years ago they were using unbuffered formalin and they would throw it in and go away for a week and go on vacation, come back, take a sample out. Uh, but now that they're pretty, you know, it's like 24 hours and then even sometimes some places, if, if it's a Friday, it'll sit through the weekend, but most places will actually come in, someone will come in and take it out after 24 hours. And they're using buffered formula, so it still buggers up the DNA, but it's not as bad as it was. So it's just things to be aware of. And when you're also using older samples, the best thing, if you take a, a slice off the top, throw that one away because of the oxidation that occurs and use the next slice. So you can get decent stuff out of it, but not very much. Um, so we could do manual preps, but of course we're not the only one interested in that. And uh, there is a, something out there called uh, Nextera, which was uh, Epicenter developed. And they were bought in by Illumina uh, primarily for this protocol. It uses a transposon that integrates in to the DNA and it brings in uh, a little bit of sequence and that sequence that the, is engineered to be a tag which you can then amplify and put on the sequencing uh, tags that you need and then this becomes a library. So uh, it, it shears the DNA by what they call tagmentation so wherever there's an insertion it is a double-stranded break so you can break it up into smaller pieces. Uh, its standard input is 50 nanograms, it's quite nice. Uh, it uh, does have a PCR reaction involved in it, um, but it's uh, low input, very easy. It's just like minutes instead of hours. Uh, uh, you could do 96 on the time very easily, and it's not that expensive. Um, it's about 70 bucks a, a library. So we we'd played around with that a while back. It does have a bit of a bias. Um, it tends to like to insert in AT rich regions, and so there is a bit of a GC bias. But it's not, and I don't think I have a slide to show you, but um, we've been looking at that hard lately, and it's not that bad. It's acceptable. Uh, but this is what a library looked like. Just some of the metrics and libraries, and so you can see some of the data that comes off. Uh, this is uh, 50 nanograms input. This is the, the run on a bioanalyzer. This is showing you the fragments, the fragment sizes. These two spikes are the standards. Uh, and so this is a, you can see the peak. Of this. It's fairly reproducible, two different libraries here. Um, but it's fairly broad, right? The, the peak size, and that's one of the, the characteristics of the uh, next era libraries is the peaks are quite broad. This uh, has in some implications in structural variant calling. If you're trying to call a, a variant that's a translocation between chromosomes, doesn't matter really how far apart they are, you can just tell they're on different chromosomes. But if you're trying to detect uh, insertions and deletions and you want to use the, you know, the distribution of these fragment sizes, the tighter that is, the better it is for your data. But it's a trade-off, so we can uh, make rapidly make libraries, but they're not great for calling uh, small structural variations. Large ones are fine. You know, if it's 100 kb, you'll still you'll still be able to detect it. This is the output of, of sequencing. Just if you haven't seen these, this is a uh, roughly um, this is the insert size here. So this, this library is about 443 bases. This is an important metric: the reads per start point. So this is uh, just a, exactly what it says. It's a measure of the number of times, number of reads on average that started at the same place in the sequence. So this gives an, a measure of the complexity of the library. It has to do with that PCR artifact collapsing. Uh, you want it to be close to one as possible. So one point, this is very good, 1.02. Um, you probably, you definitely want it to be 1.2. If it's above 1.2, you're going to have trouble with your library. Uh, and what happens is you saturate the library very quickly. So you're sequencing and here's four lanes of the same library, but you won't get your yield of decreases. The more you put in, you'll just keep getting the same thing over and over, and you'll collapse it out. Uh, so if it's higher than 1.2, you probably want to make a new library. So this is automatically generated by the machine? Or is this is actually, this is all generated, um, you know, the, we pull it together in our own format, but this comes off the, the instruments, yeah. Just off your first alignment. But you'll need, a, you'll need some kind of uh, QC pipeline to quickly look at what you're getting. This is the yield. This is the, the total yield in, in gigabases per lane um, the, of aligned reads. And so we can watch that too to make sure that all these metrics are all of these metrics are looked at. 
right? We've got the uh, percent mapping. So this is the percentage of the reads that actually map to the genome. So it should be, these, are, these ones are a little low actually. It's, uh, it's because I think this low end here, we're reading through into adapters and makes them hard to align. So we're working on making that a little tighter. But we played around with it quite a bit. And so 50 nanograms is the typical input. You can do it with five nanograms with a little funky little peak here. Don't know why, but that's the way it turns out. You can see, you'll see it's quite broad. Uh, but you can even do two nanograms and get decent libraries out. You have to control the ratio of the transposon to the DNA because that's going to determine your insert size. So we can actually dial, move this peak around anywhere you want, pretty much. Uh, it always stays broad, but by changing the ratio of the of the transposon that you put into the DNA, you can. It's a, quite a linear relationship, actually. You're making me do math. It's early in the morning. Uh, so there's about six picograms. Uh, of DNA in a cell. So a thousand cells is six nanograms. And so that is one third of that. So it's about 300 cells. If I did my math right. I'm usually out by a factor of 10, but I don't think on that one. Um, so these, these libraries we sequenced, and uh, this one wasn't bad. The five nanogram, pretty decent insert size. Again, the, the, the standard deviation was higher than we, we would like, but we'll, it's so simple, we'll accept it. Um, the, uh, where's the, the number of reads were here, the percent map was pretty good, so average for these types of libraries. Reads per star point, getting a little high, 1.1, but that's still, that'll still work, that was okay. Yield wasn't bad. The 1.2 nanograms, you can see that the reads per star point was unacceptable here. So this was over amplified, we did too many cycles of amplification. Uh, and so we'd have dialed, and we've done it, we've dialed back on that, and we can get more like this out of a 1.2 nanograms. <laughs> uh, and it's an important, actually, point that Francis raises in that as we push this down f further and further, you have to start thinking about how many genomes are you sampling, right? If you're getting down to the, uh, you can do 100 picograms and you can do targeted sequencing or whole genome off that. And, like how, how deep do you want to go? You know, there's no point in if you've got 100 genomes in your sample, you're doing targeted sequencing, there's no point in going to 10,000 X deep. Right? I mean, you're, you're just wasting it. You don't, you've saturated it completely. So we're getting to the point. We, we didn't even worry about this until about six months ago, and then one day we just started, well, how, much, how many genomes are really there? Because we're always looking for like a 1,000x coverage or 5,000x coverage. And uh, then we started thinking about it. It's just crazy. So you do have to think about how many genomes you're putting in there. All right, laser capture. So this is recent, what we've been trying to do to solve our problems. Uh, this is, a, again, a pancreatic cancer. It's marked up by a pathologist. Those regions are then captured. You can see they're cut out and leaving the stroma behind. Uh, this was just uh, deep KRAS sequencing just to see how it worked out. Number of cells, his, his estimate of the number of cells he's getting us. Uh, so it's various numbers of cells, various preps, so some of these numbers are a little different. Uh, but roughly we get, here's the yield, this is an important one. So we're getting, on most of the samples, we were getting at least 100 nanograms or some, some about 200 nanograms. So that's enough for us to work with and do the studies we want to do. Uh, the deep KRAS, this one actually had two KRAS mutations in it. Right, so you can see the, the ones, uh, this is the heterogeneity, so there was a subset of uh, cells there that didn't have uh, as much. Um, without the, the, this enrichment, there's no way we would be able to detect those. From flow sorting, uh, first problem there was we don't have a lot of material coming off. Can we extract the DNA? The green line here is your uh, theoretical based on six picograms uh, per cell. How, how much DNA would you get out? Uh, this is 50% yield. Uh, we have a couple failures, but uh, most of them now are falling in here. So we're actually getting the DNA out. And we can sequence that. Again, this is uh, KRAS targeted. Uh, but you can see that uh, now we're seeing roughly, so this is the, the, the mutant is around 40% of the reads. So this is a sample that was uh, only about uh, 10 or 15% uh, tumor content. And so if this was a uh, heterozygous, it would only be about 7.5% uh, you know, of the reads and it's got up to 40%, which is pretty close to 50-50. So this is pretty pure stuff. Um, and we're, we haven't done nothing to know. There, there's always a variation here. Uh, you know, reads, up, reads don't beautifully come out at 50-50. The depth here isn't very big. And it might be, and this one's about the same. So it might be that either they're not quite pure, or just by chance these two samples, we're just getting a sampling. We're getting around 40% variant. Uh, but if we went deeper, it may go closer to 50-50. Now the other advantage is you can get some very clean data. So this copy number, and we'll zoom in on a couple. So this, this is one here where uh, we've lost uh, some of chromosome 17. Right? We have an amplification as well. Uh, and this amplification, if we zoom in on it, 
and see what it's doing. It's herb B2, important uh, driver in cancer, so that, that one's interesting. And then this one's quite interesting. So this is where a complete loss of chromosome 18. Uh, and so imagine if only 5% of the data were actually uh, uh, from the tumor, it would even be hard just to see this, this chromosome loss. But even within that, the remaining chromosome, we can actually clearly see a deletion here. And that deletion, if you just map it to the genome, uh, it looks like, we haven't mapped the exact breakpoints yet, but it looks like it would probably uh, take off the tail end of SMAD4, and SMAD4 is a, a common driver in pancreatic cancer, a loss of SMAD4. So uh, that's uh, uh, looking like it's working, so I think the take-home message there is the more pure your sample is, the better. That's why leukemia, if you work on leukemia, good for you. <laughs> you can get lots of sample and it's nice and pure. All right, so circulating tumor cells, I'm going to throw some current stuff in here. Um, this is an instrument from Illumina. It's not, it's uh, pre-release, it's not a commercial instrument. It's called a mag sweeper. Uh, it actually looks, I, when they delivered it, I didn't expect it to look as nice as it does since it's not really a commercial instrument. Uh, but it does look like a finished instrument. This, these are magnets, and these are plastic sleeves, and these magnets then go into the plastic sleeves, and then using uh, uh, antibodies linked to uh, paramagnetic beads, we can go through the sweep through the sample. That's why they call it a mag sweeper and collect up the circulating tumor cells based on cell surface markers, and it just goes through a series of washes. It takes about, I think, an hour or two. Uh, this is a cell under phase contrast. All this background here, this is all the, the magnetic beads that come, come through in the process, come off the magnet, but this is a cell that's captured. And if we use an anti red, uh, red glowing antibody to EPCAM, which is an epithelial marker, you can clearly see this is an epithelial cell origin. And then the, the biggest problem here is that Phil has to sit down for hours now under the microscope with a pipette and collect those. <laughs> and it takes him several hours to get like 20 of them. So the typical patient, uh, the samples we're looking at now may have anywhere from 10 to 50 circulating tumor cells in three mils. And we're trying to collect those. So we haven't done much analysis on them yet because we're still fine-tuning our protocols for taking 15 cells and working with them. Sure, um, and also talk about circulating tumor DNA. So if you can detect, if you take a cancer patient and you take some of their blood, you can detect circulating tumor cells, or at least epithelial cells, uh, which are presumed to come from the tumor. Uh, and there is a correlation with the uh, stage of the cancer and the number of cells in, in many cancer types. Uh, what we want to actually do then is, is actually be able to analyze those cells and look for the mutations. Um, and same with the circulating tumor DNA, which we'll get into in a second. It's obviously, uh, if you could detect these things, uh, it's a great way. It's a it's relatively non-invasive. It's a needle stick. You can take some blood, and you could screen it and look for, like, KRAS mutations, for example, which are common in pancreatic cancer, common in colorectal cancer. Um, and you can almost see it being a screen for most of the common variants uh, in the population, it's getting cheap enough that you could almost screen everyone for this routinely. But what it's really useful for is a monitoring tool. So if someone comes in and you treat them for their cancer, you can then uh, take blood over time and look for the mutations that you knew they had because they were there at the beginning and see if they come back. So that's one of the, it's more of a monitoring tool right now than a, a, a diagnostic tool. But uh, I think so, if someday it may be cheap enough. But the question is, what, what we need to do is, is look at enough normal people you know, if we took everyone's blood in this room and sequenced it, would we find some KRAS mutations? And my prediction is probably yes, but it shouldn't, you shouldn't be worried about it. I th you know, I think, I think our bodies are clearing cancer all the time. Uh, and so we'll it depends. the problem is if we turn up the resolution, the lower we go, the more we see it, we're getting more questions than answers right now. And, and that's why it's a really exciting time. Uh, and it's great, you know, you guys are taking this course and, and analyze the data because uh, the we go down, we see more and more heterogeneity. Heterogeneity is very important. Uh, we're starting to drill real deep and see that the, in the relapse tumor, those mutations were already there. And so the question is, you treat someone with a drug, do they, uh, do they become resistant over time because the cells have got uh, accumulated mutations? Or were, they, were those mutations already there? And all you've done is you've killed off some cells, but this other subpopulation is, is continuing to grow. There's a great paper, the, the original BRAF paper, I don't have it in here, but um, original BRAF for melanoma paper is quite interesting to look at. There's a picture of a guy in there who's got, looks like he's got golf balls under his skin all over him. Um, and then they treat him with the BRAF inhibitor. 
uh, for that specific V600E mutation, and they all disappear, I think in 15 weeks. I mean, the guy looks almost normal in 15 weeks. They just show another picture at 23 weeks, I think it is, and he's got them all back. Every single one is back. And if you look at the pictures carefully, they're in the same spot. So it's not that these aren't new tumors coming up. They're all back, and they're all back about the same rate. So I don't believe that the, all those tumors developed resistance to the drug. There's something else going on there. It was probably already there. Right? And, uh, but that brings up questions of if every single metastatic tumor carried that was heterogeneous, right, and carried that mutation uh, already that gave the resistance. Now, they didn't sample them, so we don't know what the, the mutations were. But uh, uh, that it brings into question with how does a metastatic uh, tumor arise? Is it a single cell that comes? And seeds it, and then you'd think, well, how can that have heter much heterogeneity then, right? And or is it a clump of cells that seeds it? And these are a lot of open questions right now. We don't know, but it's really fascinating paper to read. Sorry. We are starting to do that right now. Yeah, yeah. So um, it well, it's hard to get they're hard to get the material, but uh, I've hooked up with a guy who's doing rapid autopsies. These are patients that um, consent and within two hours of death they're brought into the, the morgue and are essentially torn apart. Um, they get kilograms of material from them, so they get everything out of them. It's really fascinating. They, they take the, the liver out and they'll section it into you know, half centimeter sections, lay those down and image each one of those, and then they'll cut it into cubes and image that. And so if, he, if I get a metastatic tumor from him or a couple from the same liver, I know exactly where they were. It's really a fascinating uh, data set. He's got about 75 of those now. They've got primary tumor, metastatic tumor, lymph nodes, invading lymph nodes, all the stuff. Uh, so I'm looking at lung and liver mets to see what is the difference between those. And uh, there's, there's a number of studies. If you search the literature, you'll find people have sequenced mets and primaries. But usually it's one primary and one met, and they're trying to make conclusions from it. We're doing five mets for liver, five mets from lung from the same patient and the primary, and trying to figure out how related they are figure out why, why do some go to, and some patients never get liver meds, right, and so why don't they, right? so that's the kind of things we're interested in. Uh, but the, the circulating uh, DNA, so we all have circulating DNA, um, cancer patients tend to have more just because the, the necrosis of the tumors, and if that DNA, if you look at it, what you get out, you, can, you don't get a huge amount, but what you get out is very fragmented as well, so this is, you probably might not be able to read this, the scale here, but that's about 180 base pairs, you see these sort of uh, mono, di, tri, if you think of uh, nucleosomes. So they're just nucle it's degraded down to nucleosome size. Uh, so that has Im important implications if you're trying to do targeted sequencing uh, and you have a 500 base pair amplicon that you're using, it's probably not going to work because there's not much material there that, 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 that's that big. Uh, the trick here is making sure that when you isolate it, you don't lyse some of the, the sort of normal uh, circulating leukocytes and things like that. And you can tell there'd be this giant peak here of, of intact genomic uh, contaminating DNA, which is just the normal DNA. So again, this is getting down to, you know, how low can we go? What are we trying to detect? And this is another piece of equipment we have that's, uh, again, uh, pre-commercial release. But uh, hopefully it will come out in the market in the not too, too distant uh, future. So here's uh, a sample in which, let's say there's only 0.01% that has a mutant allele on it. Well, we sequence that. There's no way we can call that. Right. If you look specifically at that, like KRAS, and you see it, and you go, oh, yeah, there it is, at 0.01%. But then you say, okay, now I'm going to let my pipeline tell me where, where else do I see 0.01% changes, and your false positive rate would be through the roof. So what this device does is it actually uh, isolates the mutant allele and enriches it. And so you can, see, you can sequence it. Your signal to noise then is much better. And this little cartoon, if it works, this is from them. I didn't do this. Uh, is how it works. So here's your, your population of, of fragments. And these oligos that are perfect match to the, the mutant allele, so they have a, a single base mismatch to the, the normal allele, are attached to the gel within the system. All right, so you, you take your samples, you put them on the gel, and then they have an electric field which is kind of circulating. This is their techno technology called SCODA. And it ha makes a differential uh, separation of the mutant and the, the normal allele. And if it works, I do have a little movie. If it comes up. All right. Let's see if it'll work. Oh, I can't do this. 
Maybe it won't work. It worked the other day. It worked on a PC. Why wouldn't it work on a Mac? I don't get it. Oh, it's cool. Well, maybe I'll, I'll crash out of here at the end and see if I can get it to work. I'll just move on for now. Uh, so this is their data, but we've, we've actually done some spiking experiments and getting very similar results. Uh, so this is 0.01%. Uh, this is These are synthetic samples that they've mixed together. But 0.01% KRAS, common KRAS mutation uh, in a plasma sample. And if you sequence it just on the mice, you can see you get 130,000 reads that are the G, the, the wild type, and only 19 reads that were the, the variant. So this is because it's at such low frequency. There's no way you're going to call that in next-gen data. Um, and this is a wild type. This is just someone's you know, plasma period, and you can see the numbers are almost identical. There's 11. So these are sequence errors. These are probably mostly sequence errors and a few real ones, right? You're using the on target, so after you run that, that chip and it pulls out just the mutant alleles, you can see here this is the wild type, and there's, there's very few of them compared to now the mutant. And out of the plasma sample, you can see a, a very big difference. So you're detecting real events here. Right, so it's a, cool, it's a cool system, but not quite available at the prime time. All right, so the trends we've talked about, um, this is really should be updated. This has gone now to, through to 213. Uh, they, they're getting bigger and cheaper, it's sort of flattening out now, as I said, but it was a bit of an arms race. Uh, it was who can produce the most data, who can produce the longest reads. Uh, Illumina won that, that race at that time. Uh, but there's been more and more uh, systems coming out. There's the, the Proton. Uh, the 2500, the Pac Bio, uh, the Ion Torrent, really, the PGM, and eventually Oxford Nanopore, where these are more moderate throughput but faster run times. They have a lot more clinical applications, right? And in, the, in our workflow here in the research side, we don't really care if it takes us a couple of months to analyze a tumor because we've got you know, a number of tumors in the pipeline and they're just coming out all the time. Uh, so if it takes a couple of months to go through down through this whole pipeline, we don't care. But on the clinical side, especially in cancer, you have to be quick. Right? These patients, uh, want to, they need to put them on something quick. Uh, and so we have a really a week, but it actually turns out to be less, as I'll show you. So here we are in, in Toronto and just up the street. This is where the OICR is in the Mars building. This is the hole in the ground, which is now kind of looks like that. Uh, but we're right surrounded by all these hospitals. And in particular, I want to talk about our relationship with Princess Margaret, where we did some clinical studies. And so typically, um, Diagnoses are made a lot to do with the, uh, the site that the tumor was and limited molecular profiling. So these are sort of standard uh, molecular profiling to be done under various, uh, uh, depending on where the tumor was from. So we mentioned the melanoma and BRAF, especially the B600D. Some of these are targetable, again, the, the BRAF mutations. Uh, they are targetable with drugs, so we call them actionable, uh, and they have multiple tumor sites. But what we're really interested in is this sort of picture here, I'll blow one up here. So this is the BRAF again, which is very frequent in melanomas and targetable, but it's also relatively frequent in uh, colorectal cancer. And so the, the question is, you know, will these patients respond to a BRAF inhibitor? And the answer is, that, the short answer is actually no. Um, they, they, they won't respond, and it's just because that uh, the EGF receptor is being expressed here, where it's not being expressed, expressed here, and it gives a, a workaround for the drug. But if you hit them with an EGFR inhibitor and the BRAF inhibitor, at least in, uh, in vitro, yeah, it should work, and those are heading to clinical trials. So the idea is if we can profile a tumor and not care so much where it's from, uh, are there actual mutations that the patient would respond to? So we started a little project uh, a couple years ago. Uh, with them, and if they would take biopsies. Uh, these are advanced uh, stage metastatic patients. Uh, you're not going to change the standard of care right now, uh, but these are these are patients that have uh, typically been through uh, around three rounds of chemo for very, and had relapse after relapse or didn't respond. Uh, they have to be able to get a biopsy to us, um, and of course they have to consent to the study. We uh, needed to calibrate our system, so the we had helped the. Uh, the diagnostic lab put in a sequinome, which is a uh, genotyping platform using mass spec, uh, and they had a panel that would screen uh, 238 mutations in 19 oncogenes. So we did a comparison of that. This is the PAC bio, as I talked about earlier. Uh, and we just said, you know, could we detect those? They gave us samples with no mutations, didn't tell us what they were, uh, but they gave us some blinded 30 samples, and uh, we tried to detect on the same 19 genes. We sequenced the whole gene, not just the, the spot that, where the mutation was. Could we detect it? 
this shows you the, the pack file. This is the CCS is that circular consensus we can read around multiple times to get high accuracy. And did we detect it? We detected them all, but this one, uh, this one was, uh, we went back and looked and it was just our primer design. Uh, one of the amplicons was, wasn't working well, so we fixed that so we could detect that. So virtually we could detect everything that, uh, that they detected, so we felt that the system was ready to go. And uh, again, apologize for the, the uh, font change here. But uh, we were doing a, a project, this is the original with the pack bio, and just to see uh, what we could uh, find out and how well it would work. Uh, patients we wanted, we were hoping half the patients would say yes, almost all of them did. Um, the median age is 57, uh, they've had disease for quite a while, here's the number of treatments. So as I said, the median number of treatments already were three and the, one of the most was eight, I believe. Um, there was all different tumor types, we weren't doing leukemias, all different solid tumor types. The cellularity of what we got was pretty good. This were, um, these were uh, FFP biopsies, and uh, they were scraped out, scraped out the tumor portion. We didn't actually extract the DNA, the, the CLIA lab did. Uh, but they were doing pretty well, so they were marked up by pathologists, and then the portion of the tumor scraped out, we estimated about 60%. Um, and the, the, most of them required um, some sort of uh, radiological intervention uh, to guide the biopsy, so it was one of the bottlenecks of the whole thing. So I already talked about uh, FFPE and our, the ability to get samples out. So sometimes it's not a very big sample, um, but we were able to get, it's quite variable, the amount of DNA we got out. But in general, we were able to get uh, enough material. In blood, you can get tons, of course. Uh, the fresh FEs in the archival, a lot less. But this is still, we were getting somewhere around 500 nanograms on average, and that was enough for us to do it. This is just targeted sequencing, so not whole genome. Uh, if we were able to get DNA, we were able to successfully analyze it. Uh, we did find mutations in the first uh, set of patients, uh, and then uh, there were a number of their actional, most of them because we were looking at uh, oncogenes that uh, had a lot of drugs uh, at them. But we did find some novel ones, I'll talk about that. And the goal was to report um, back to the clinician within 21 days. So that's 21 days from the time that the patient consented, then a biopsy is done through pathology, through the CLIA lab, get DNA, get it to us, we do the sequencing. Uh, we then report back what we found. We're not a CLIA lab, so they can't use those results you know, in, for the patient management. So they'd have to be validated in the CLIA lab, and then a report generated all within three weeks. That was our goal. And in two-thirds of the time, we did make that 21-day goal. Uh, a lot of the outliers here, sometimes um, one of the outline centers would consent a patient, but then schedule them for a biopsy three months later. <laughs> so that kind of there blows our timeline. Um, we won't go through all of these slides, but we had the first 50 patients. We were able to get 43 of them with enough material, uh, and six of them had their, their treatment decisions impacted. And that shows the spectrum of mutations. Uh, this is the ones that were impacted, so we got partial response or confirmed, you know, confirmed partial response. This is the, the clinician's talking. But this is what we found, and uh, we, we found it in the biopsy and in the archive and all the, in most of these cases. There was about a get my numbers right, 90% concordance between the archive sample and the, the biopsy that was taken at, at a later date. Uh, these are the some of the novel ones. I'll talk about that, that first one, AKT1, in a minute, I think. Uh, and this is just the study continued on for about two years, and this is the overall. So we had uh, in, enrolled about, uh, about 140 patients. And uh, at this point, we were looking at 19 oncogenes in the, uh, the PAC biosystem, and then we switched over to the MySeq. Uh, just because uh, the MySeq was, this is the reason we went this way, this is the first real fast turnaround instrument, and we only have three days to do the sequencing. This guy can sequence in about an hour, uh, and then we went to the MySeq, went sequence overnight, uh, and then we expanded it to, instead of 19 genes, to do 54 genes, and uh, then and pretty much the impact was around 20% of the patients we found something that we could, uh, was considered actionable. Towards the end of the project, we were doing it this way, I talked about the rain dance here. So we had this uh, hotspot panel that they developed that covers actually 54 genes, and if you look in COSMIC in those 54 genes, the amplicons would cover around 13,500 entries in COSMIC. Uh, we already talked about how it's done, the, the droplets are brought together. Uh, emulsion PCR, break it, and then uh, put it on the MySeq. And we were doing, you could do up to eight samples per run. Uh, quite, quite often it was only a single sample because you can't sit around waiting for seven more samples if you only got one. You have to process what you get that week. We opened this up across Ontario, so there were a number of sites sending us samples, so the logistics were being worked out, and that was quite good. Uh, from an informatics standpoint, some of the things uh, that seemed like minor challenges were actually quite difficult was to develop a tracking system. 
these are all redacted. I'll put, suppose these are all identifiable fields, and so that's why the black boxes are there. Um, but all these centers, then we had to, you know, they had to send the samples in. We had to know they were coming, get alerted, and, and you're working across multiple firewalls across. And so it was quite a, a big deal to get this together. But we had a nice tracking system where we could track samples. Um, and then uh, you could input the information and generate a report. And the goal was to, to as much as we could, have an automated um, process for gener generating these reports. These were then reviewed by an a expert panel, which was composed of clinicians and uh, genomicists like myself. Uh, and it had to have a minimum of three clinicians in the room to make a decision on whether there's an axonal mutation and would re be reported back. What am I doing time-wise? 10.30? Yes. We'll make it. Uh, so this is one example here. It's a 50-year-old, 53-year-old woman, <coughs> platinum-resistant, low-grade serious ovarian cancer, uh, already metastatic, uh, had multiple treatments before, uh, detected a KRAS G12D mutation, and uh, were started on into a uh, phase one clinical trial. So Princess Margaret Hospital is one of the major sites for in North America for clinical trials. So these patients, and what we're trying to do is um, uh, guide them. They're going to go on some clinical trial, but rather than flipping a coin, we're trying to, from this information, guide them onto the appropriate trial. Uh, and this patient, oops, responded. Uh, this is the AKT1 mutation that we found. Um, find no information on this anywhere. In the literature, in Cosmic, no matter where we look. Uh, this is looking at the gene itself. There, there is an AKT1 uh, relatively common mutation, E17K. This is an activating mutation. Ours was in here. It's in the kinase domain. Incredibly conserved region, right? It's a looks like a pretty severe change, a charge change, and as I said, absolutely conserved down through zebrafish here. Uh, you would predict that this is probably detrimental to the protein. What you can't say is, is it activating or inactivating? Does it turn this gene on or off? If you have an inhibitor for this gene and this, this mutation is actually turning the gene off, there's no point in giving the person an inhibitor. All you're going to give them is the side effects and no benefit. But they were put on, based on this information, they were put on uh, a inhibitor that inhibited the mTOR pathway, and uh, although these are not the same plane as been pointed out to me by radiologists, uh, it did actually shrink the tumor. Unfortunately, the patient uh, continued to get would have issues and, and it was ill and had to be removed from the drug and uh, subsequently died. All right, so incidental findings: if you're doing exome sequencing or whole genome sequencing or even targeted sequencing. Um, there's a big debate right now as to what to do with all the information. So if you sequence the exome on anyone in this room, you'll probably find 75 to 200 potentially del deleterious genes uh, that you would predict would impact the gene function. If you do a whole genome, you'll probably find about 600 genes in any one of us that it impacts. Now, that doesn't mean that, that it really affects us greatly. It may have to do with, uh, you know, depends on your lifestyle and how much fat you eat. And if you low fat, you, the genes that are impacted never matter to you. But uh, the question is how to interpret all that. And once interpreted, do you, are you required to, to give that information back? And this is really a hotly debated thing right now. Um, and so there's ways you can think about getting around that in that if you set up an analysis pipeline and you could, these are genes that you may not want to look at. And so you could just say, okay, I'll sequence the exome. These genes are in there, but I'm only going to let the pipeline put through the cancer results, for example, to treat this patient. Now, from the point of view of cancer care, that's all we care about up front, right? We've got to get this person on a drug within, a, within three weeks. Uh, so we don't, we're not going to try and interpret all this other stuff. Uh, we just want to find out, is there an actual mutation here? But in the longer term, um, you know, these are things that people may or may not want to know about. And so consent forms have to start addressing that. Uh, whether or not people, some people, especially in Huntington's disease here, many people do not want to know the outcome of that. Uh, and so, the, the, but as a, a, we're not a clinical lab either, so we're a research lab. And in these, these tumors we're sequencing, uh, many of these patients are dead and pancreatic, but in other cancers, these patients are still alive. And if we find things that can impact their, their long-term health, not forget the cancer, or we find things that are, you know, should be, might be interesting to their siblings, for example, like a BRCA1 mutation, um, what's, the, what's the responsibility to feed that information back to them? So it's a, an open question at the moment. The American College of Medical Genetics has a list of, I think it's about 50 genes that they say you 
just are morally responsible for reporting those back. But the mechanism to report it back, especially from the research side, is not well defined. So in for maps, what do we have to generate to just do this project? I already talked a little bit about um, uh, the tracking system in itself. We made a, a consequences database, which is really geared at the common mutations. And so early on, it was easy. We had 19 genes, 238 mutations from that panel that we had tested. Uh, and But we needed to have a system where we automatically would generate a report. So we sort of brought in all the information, and then we enlisted the help of a bunch of clinical fellows who went through and took a subset of them and actually went through and read all the, the papers and, and tagged it all together so that uh, we could just quickly generate the report. But you can see that that would amplify very quickly as you start doing exomes. There's not that great annotation, so that's a, a great need. And what you don't want to do, this is from uh, Steve Friend's publication, is you can't return this to a clinician. Right? You need a report that's clean and simple. This is all the information that you might be of interest and in help interpret the results. But the clinician's not going to sit down and try and understand this for several hours. He's got five minutes. <laughs> that's, he wants a report. So somehow we have to do all this up front and automated in order to, uh, to generate the report. And this is, the, again, the report that we generated. It was quite simple. Uh, gave a little information about frequency, gave background, and gave links to uh, some uh, literature here, and also whether there were clinical trials that they available that they might put the patient on if there was an actionable uh, drug here. All right, so we talked about data complexity. Uh, we talked about data volumes increasing, as you'll see in, in uh, probably some of your exercises will be dumbed down in quotations to uh, not have a full subset of data. You might just zero in on part of it. Uh, I guess you're using the cloud this year, so maybe you can do more comprehensive analyses. But uh, clearly some of these these, uh, and these uh, runs and these analyses, like even alignment takes 24 hours, right, So of a whole genome. So you, you know, it depends how much data you have. But that's, uh, you're really starting to uh, uh, stress out the compute and the storage resources. The cloud has its own issues, um, depending on, uh, again, that's a debatable issue about uh, uh, whether the it's secure enough for people's information. You've got someone's whole genome out there, all their genetic information. Uh, is that acceptable to put on the cloud? Uh, I mean, all your banking information is on the cloud, so <laughs> hopefully it is. Um, but then the analyses are very complex. So even like transcripts, uh, RNA-seq, for example, it's not just about getting the transcript profiles. You, know, you get better data than, than doing an array, but, uh, but you also want to look at differential splicing, a differential allelic expression, RNA editing, fusion protein. You can call variants and all of that. Uh, so it's a very, you, just from one, one run here, you get a lot of data that's complex and how to put it together. Uh, validation, we talked a little bit about our verification, which really should be. Uh, well, verification is where you're, you're, you're confirming that in the sample that you detected it, that it's true. And validation would be, I'm going to take that because I think that's an important variant or important gene and put that across a cohort of 1,000 samples. So you need a lots of assays to, to deal with that. And as you'll go through the week here, you've got to consider the bigger picture. Right? So it's not just about collecting all the variants and looking for uh, a common variant or even just one common gene. Uh, there's some good examples of that. People get lucky. Uh, but in general, you've really got to put it in context of the whole thing in pathway analysis. We talked about data privacy, so I'll skip that. All right, so what needs improvement? Everything. Absolutely everything. So take what you learn here, go away, and make something better. Uh, alignment needs to be improved. I mean, things aren't bad. It's not a terrible situation, but uh, there are mistakes made in alignment. All of those propagate through and, and I think are a major contributor to our false positives. <coughs> Uh, calling low frequency variants, so getting digging down into the, the low frequency heterogeneity. Structural vari vari variation detection is poorly handled right now. There's lots of programs, lots of software out there. Uh, there's 70 aligners that you can go and, and read about. About half of them you can actually download a functional <coughs> piece of software. Uh, and probably a quarter of those actually work. Right? So you, there's just lots of room for improvement. RNA-seq, differential splicing variant calling, RNA editing are all things. And uh, the big one, I think, is functional annotation. All these variants we're detecting, what are they actually doing? Clearly, uh, you know, laboratory, you'll, you'll never completely eliminate the need to go to the lab. Like that AKT1 mutation, we, we're going to have to do some lab work on that one. Structural variation detection between what and what? So translocations, large in insertions, large deletions, things like that. Uh, they're poorly detected right now. And then the big challenge, bringing it all together. 
Right? How do you take all this different information, including the, 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 cl the clinical data here, and just put it all together to come up with a diagnosis? All right. Unless you have questions. I have a question. Um, so I'm doing a lot of FFP um, sequencing on RMIC. Mm -hmm. So I'm just curious what you thought is like an appropriate coverage for this stuff. Because I'm noticing quite a bit of problems. Or like low coverage stuff, maybe if there are problems. Um, what tumor stuff. type? Um, Endometrial So what's the cellularity? Do you know? It's probably. It's pretty good. Um, most of um, them, um, between 50 to 70 percent. Yeah, looks that's pretty good. Um, we, you've got lots of real estate there on, on like you can go real deep. Um, I, I think you need to be in the 500x to 1000x. Uh, and going higher than that probably doesn't help you a lot. Right? You just, you can go 10,000x and you see all sorts of things, but you're just starting to, you're starting to get, starting to believe the false positives because the random, the random errors aren't completely random once you start piling up. FFP introduces a, a little complexity in that the DNA is damaged, and so you do start seeing a higher background error rate. That's right. Yeah, and you have to look at every base in the amp. So if you're doing amplicons, like targeted sequencing, then you need to uh, plot the, you know, the ACGT on every single one of those bases across your normals, as many normals as you can, and start to understand what the variation is, and then across all of your FFPE samples. And you'll start seeing to some, it's not just the, uh, you know, A's in general tend to be, you, you know, destroyed. It's sometimes sequence context. So, like so a trinucleotide signature will more frequently be hit than others. And so you just sort of you got to start of understand that profile. Once you understand that profile, you can sort of set your bottom end to how low you can go. It's bright, It's pretty easy to call variance down to five percent. You can probably call it variance quite readily down to two percent. But you're starting to, around two percent, three percent. You start your false positive rate goes through the roof. Uh, and it's a trade off of how. How much do you want to know about the heterogeneity, and how much work do you want to do in the validation to show that they're real? So somewhere around five percent is a good cutoff if you just really want to capture. If you've got enough samples and you want to capture most of the events, and if you miss it in one sample, you say, oh, "I'll catch it in another one at a higher frequency." Right? So it depends on the structure, but yeah, you do have to be a little careful in the FFP. Are these old samples? New samples? Some of them are. Some of them are. So, right. Yeah. Anything over 10 years is almost can't get data out of them. You get about 30% success rate just getting sequence. Like um, good. Yeah. Like five. Yeah, five. Five should be good. But there, but you definitely will see a higher background error. Just a quick question. Uh, I mean, not all of the genome is been sequenced, though, right? And there's a lot of bias from PCR PCR processes to go to next gen sequencing. How much are we actually missing? Like, when you do a whole genome. Analysis, how much of the genome we actually capture? Well, I mean, uh, yeah, not, it depends how you define the genome. So the genome's been sequenced. It wasn't done, it was done by clone base, right? Right. Um, but there, but that's. But there's still gaps. Yeah, there. that was, there's gaps in there, and also that only represented, 70% of that sequence comes from one individual, mm -hmm. and the rest of it comes from about another 12. So it's a very small subset of the population. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's chunks of the, de of the genome that weren't in those individuals that are missing, and, and there's an effort to figure out how we can better represent the genome, uh, but until we do, uh, I don't know what percent is complete, but it's pretty complete. But when you do a whole genome sequence and align it, uh, you can align using the paradigms, you can get alignment to a lot of the genome in the high 90s or low, mid, mid, low to mid 90s percent that's covered. There's going to be more and more errors in certain region, more and more misalignments. Mm -hmm. But you could easily be looking at you know, good, good data on 85 percent of the genome. And yeah. there's stuff that's not aligning or not really usable. Most of it's in very repetitive regions, and the question is, is dubious whether or not that, that's important. I mean, it could be, mm -hmm. but you can't even develop primers to go in and verify. Yeah, it's, it's part of the problem because it's so repetitive. Yeah. So you'll see, I'm sure you'll probably see, come in your analysis, you'll see mucins mutated, uh, you'll see um, olfactory receptors, things like that, which are just gene families of high similarity, mm -hmm. and those are, those are all just misaligned reads. Most of them. Some of them will be real, and, but if you're doing cancer and uh, olfactory receptors mutated, do you care? Maybe. If you see it in a lot of your samples, it's either a, a systematic error or it's actually important and we don't understand why. But, so it's a trade off between filtering your data, not over filtering your data, and trying to be open minded and not biased in your interpretation, like saying, oh, olfactory receptors can't be involved in cancer. It could actually be a real driver in cancer and we just don't understand why.
Well, there, there, there are. Um, I mean, if you do whole genome sequence on the Illumina, for example, um, so you shear, you randomly shear the, the genome up. You can do a non, if you got enough material going in, you can do a non PCR amplified. But let's say it's got some amplification in it, and then you sequence the genome, you see a variant, and then you do something like AmpliSeq to verify it, and you sequence. So that's now a PCR based, right? So it's no longer a random shear. You're actually targeting into a region. Uh, so it's a different technology from that standpoint that it's uh, PCR based, and if you sequence it on the ion torrent, it's a different technology for the readout. You can still get fooled that way because uh, some of these muses, What's for the example, of that yeah. We just about. So you, you may reproduce that, that yeah, you might reproduce it and, and start to believe it because your PCR primers actually don't amplify what you think they're they're amplifying multiple sites even though you don't think they are, and uh, you're just amplifying that other site and then you see the read. But usually that's you can get a hint of that by the frequency, right? There's, uh, there's some really bad areas of design primers, too, that even by hand you, you just can't get to work. But you can amplify eight loci. And so you can tell that because one eighth of the reads match what you saw, and it's just one of these other genes. But the, you can blot those regions and just see uh, and look at their similarity. And, and usually you can find your variant just by doing that. But most of them are real. I mean, the, the data quality is pretty good now. It's not the same library. You start going back to the original DNA, yeah. But, and, and there are groups that are doing, uh, you know, Illumina sequencing for both verification. And that's, that's becoming more acceptable because the data quality is so good. And it's um, whether or not, if you did whole genome and then you make a targeted capture reagent, say a long oligo capture reagent, and you then capture out those parts and sequence them and you see the same thing and people are believing that. But, in some regions, you're going to get fooled just because it's there because of the similarity. And that's where you really have to drill down on the informatics side and search the genome for similarities and see if you can figure out how that alignment occurs. And some of the things you'll see from this alignment, you'll see a cluster of three uh, variants in a row, and then you'll go find the gene family, and you'll find, well, there's those three variants right there. So, but you can't eliminate all clusters of three, because <laughs> some of them are real. Uh, it's, uh, but it's a trade-off. How about a coffee break? Okay. We're going to take a coffee break until 11. Um, again, the washrooms are in the hall. Uh, feel free to uh, get yourself set up. There's a couple of people just joined, so I'm going to move you around. And uh, John's going to be around for a while, so if you yeah. need to ask him any questions specifically about your project. Yeah.